All right. Welcome to a Kickstart Goal Setting Program. This is a core unit from BSB PEF 101, Plan and Prepare for Work Readiness. Um, it's basically, I'll just give you a little bit of background. What is it about? This, the training program, it's actually a two days workshop which is designed keeping in my mind my cohort, which are refugee. So what I've done is I've condensed this two days of workshop into two 40 minute session. So in my first session, we'll be concentrating more on working on the barriers, what our refugee clientele uh, face once they arrive in Australia. And this is the goal is to find an employment. Um, these barriers can be any. It can be the language barrier and also the trauma and the struggle, what they have gone through, you know, from leaving their country and they arriving in Australia. And in my second 40 minute session, I will be covering like how they, these barriers can be overcome and how the goal settings or smart goal settings can be, can be useful or how can they do those smart goal settings so they can overcome their barriers and they can find an employment for themselves. So here, it's, it's very challenging at the moment because uh, when I'm delivering these programs, my clientele is all refugee. So we talk to them about their barriers, we brainstorm the ideas, and you know, we discuss what they have gone through in past. However, <laughs> I'm presenting this to my, you know, my trainers, my work colleagues, um, so it's, it's, I'm not sure if, if we are, any of us here are migrant or have moved from other country or their parents or grandparents have moved from this other country and they have been Australia, in Australia for long. So it's very challenging, but I'll try my level best to make you understand, uh, you know, what barriers are and how they can uh, be overcome, especially keeping in my mind the refugee is our clientele. So your role is that in this learning, we'll take ourselves a little bit to a journey where we will step in the shoes of, um, of refugee and we will learn about their journey, their sacrifices, their struggles they have gone through and what barriers do they usually face. And secondly, uh, at the end of the session, we'll put our trainer hat on and we'll explore how we can actually support them uh, in our respective field. And for example, if you have a refugee coworker at your workplace, how we can support them to overcome these barriers or any difficulties they're facing. Or if we have, if you're doing some training sessions, if you have any refugee uh, learner, so maybe they've, they're facing some language barrier or something, or it's difficult for them to understand. So how we can help them and support them to overcome those barriers as well. Any question with that? Is it, is it clear? Does it make sense? Perfect. So welcome to the Kickstart Goal Setting Program. You have been selected to participate in this program. So imagine now we are refugees, okay? Where we will discuss topics rele relevant to job seekers in your local area. This program has been designed around the importance of identifying barriers, importance of setting goals, working towards achieving goals and impact that re reaching our goals can have in many areas of our lives. So what we'll be covering today is identifying the barriers and, and brainstorm how they can be overcome. In my second session, we will continue to smart goals and benefit of smart goaling. Learning objective is by the end of this workshop, you'll be able to identify barriers, learning strategies to overcome the barriers and develop smart goals in your priority areas. And we're working towards one goal at the moment, which is finding an employment in Australia. Okay. Before I go further, I have a question here to ask. Do any of us know what is the difference between a refugee or migrant? Anyone? 
Um, I think refugee have have come here under, you know, like maybe escaping war and things like that, whereas migrant have sort of chosen to migrate here kind of thing, Capreet, if that makes sense. Spot on. It is. It is. Spot on. Uh, migrants are basically is you make a conscious decision uh, to leave your home country and you come to other country. So in this scenario, I am migrant in Australia um, because me and my family, we chose to leave India because our back home is in India. So we chose to leave India and we moved to Australia for a better life, for a better education and you know, a better uh, future for our kids. So that's the biggest difference. However, with migrants, if we have an option to go back home, if things doesn't work out as we planned, we can always you know, wrap up things and we can go back home. And also, for example, if I'm missing my family, I can always visit my family every, every time. Well, just because of COVID, not at the moment. However, anytime you know, you're feeling homesick or if there's some uh, wedding or celebration, we can always go back. However, with the refugees, it's different. They have to leave their country because they are fleeing a conflict. It can be a war. It can be a social, political conflict, violence, poverty. And they don't have choice to go back. They actually, even if they want to go back, they can't because their life is at the risk. And also um, uh, some of the refugees are forced to actually leave the country. They leave their belongings, their house, their family and their friends as well. And, and they have no, no clue what's happening you know, back there because the streets are under fire, there's a war happening. And also many refugees have to take a dangerous journey before they can reach to a safety. So the path is not very, uh, I would say, um, you know, smooth in, in the, in, in when someone is a refugee. It's not very uh, pleasing actually, uh, the amount of struggles they have gone through. Um, I'll stop sharing. In the chat, I also sent in a, my handbook. So I just give you a couple of seconds if you can please download that handbook. I will share my handbook here. So difficult roads leads to beautiful destination. So when, when I'm in training session and when I have a refugee clientele, my learners with me, I usually spend some time here going through a participant profile. What it is is basically what I'm here doing is I'm assessing their situation. I'm assessing what are their barriers are, what, is, what, what are their circumstances are at the moment. So I basically go through them with like licenses, check if they have worked in Australia in past, check if they have a police check or would they be able to pass the police check so that I can help them to find an employment. We go through about their tax file number because probably there's someone, the refugees who have never worked in Australia before and they don't know what tax file number is our super innovation fund is. And we also assess their situations like basically asking them what sort of work are they looking for or have they done any, some sort of jobs in Australia. So this is a small activity which I always spend time and do one-to-one -one with them about their talking about their hobbies, talking about their interest, what country did they came from, um, what year did they came from? How long have they been in Australia? And um, uh, all sort of situation. Do they have any family here? And uh, what, what jobs they used to do you know, back home? We have come across like many people who are doctors, who are lawyers in back home in their country. And they are struggling to find a job. Even they can't find a job for a cleaner. So it's very disheartening. Uh, you know, uh, listening to their stories. So first, when, when we, we are in the 
classroom, our workshop, first we spend one-to-one -one some time together just to assess their circumstances and assess their uh, situations. And also what sort of jobs are they after? If they have uh, licenses, can they drive? So that we, I know clearly where to look for the solutions, where can I find them to help them? So this is, this is basically um, getting to know each other and the participant profile, what we go through. I will go back to my PowerPoint slide. Again, my cohort is refugee. As I mentioned, it's, there are regular people like us, human beings, through no fault of their own, have been forced to leave their homes in search of safety. People often have little or no warning before they've been forced from their homes due to war. And many refugees have undertaken dangerous journeys to reach safety. Can I please ask, have you come across any refugee at your have you come across any refugee at your workplace or any of the training session? I have. I work with um one of the men I work with is a refugee from Ethiopia where like political unrest and stuff, so we had to escape. Yeah. Right. And and so Matt, so the refugees which have come through have have they struggled? Have they shared any of their experience with you? Like what struggle they have, uh, you know, they yeah. come through? So um, as he talks about at the start, it was very hard for him to, you know, make connections and get work and stuff like that. But again, as you mentioned, Abrid, a lot of refugees that come here are extremely well educated. Exactly. Um, so when they can actually get their foot in the door, you know, this guy went from very menial jobs and within a few years, he owned his own cleaning company. You know, so the skills are there. I guess they just need somebody to give them a chance, if you will. Exactly. That's that's what they want. I mean, when they come here, they come as an for as an open minded. They're mm. ready to do any sort of job, any work, just to start start something. You know, earning. What happened is I have also come through as a feedback from my refugee clientele as well when I'm in the session. Like when they go for an interview, they are being discriminated. A uh, lot of Aussie, um, well, not a lot, but few Aussie uh, employers feel that these people are here and they're going to take the jobs for our, for our kids. Uh, and not many jobs have been left for Australians to do just because the refugees are here, which is not correct. I always tell them this is not correct. The jobs, what you're doing, you're looking for, you know, most of the Australian kids would not do it. I mean, uh, if, if given an option, for example, cleaner, uh, trolley puller in coals or Woolworths, you know, these people, even being they've been so educated, they're happy to do some sort of job and they find themselves lucky enough to get this employment. However, if I talk to some Australian kids here, they don't want to be a cleaner. They don't want to clean the toilets in Westfield or Woolworths or anywhere else. They don't want to do these small petty jobs where these refugee clientele, even though they have come from educated background or, or maybe they are you know, rich in their own country, but they have lost so much because of war and stuff. They're happy to start something you know, from scratch, from the low bottom. Do you agree with that? Anyone? Your thoughts? Uh, hey, I agree that they are, but I think it's such a shame that they have to mm. um, be in that situation. Um, that infuriates me. It's, it's very disheartening. And whenever I, I listen to these stories, it's like, uh, I feel bad. I really feel bad about it. I know. At the nursing home I used to work at, um, we had um, about two or three um, people who are from different nations, but they were doctors, but they were actually working as um, PCAs. 
So personal care assistants. So it's it's amazing there some of these these girls and guys backgrounds. It's it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I know awesome. someone like those who are like, he's a heart surgeon back in his country. And then he came here, he worked as a PCA, but now he has passed the test, the doctor's test and all that, what the, you know, pre-requirements here. And he's back a surgeon again here. But it's a lot of struggling journey for him, but he did it at the end. So everyone, like most of the refugees, they have to start from like scratch, but they have their goals set. And if they have the right, you know, opportunities and someone to guide them, I think most of them are actually reaching their goals. They are at good positions now, but they start from very low positions. That's true. I totally get it. Yeah. And I totally agree with you. All they need is some sort of guidance pointing them the right direction if we have doctors and maybe we can help them um, to maybe recognize their degree maybe they can do certain tests here and they can do their practice here so all they need is some support from us uh, and I'm sure when they come here they come with the right mindset they are open to work and they are open uh, for any options actually to go through so we'll go through a refugee con convention. So there's some sort of raw rules and laws which are being set uh, for these sort of people uh, Well, um, as a clientele. So we'll look a little bit about their background, like who they are, where they're from, and what conventions are there to protect them. So it's 1951 Refugee Convention, the convention relating to a status of refugee also known as 1951 Refugee Convention or a Geneva Convention of 28th of July, 1951. It is a United Nations multilateral treaty that defines who a refugee is, sets out the rights of individual who are granted asylum and the responsibilities of nation that grant this asylum. So Australia is a party to the 1951 convention. So for example here, if a person was found to be a refugee and arrives in Australia, so Australia is obliged under an international law to offer a protection, support, and to ensure that they are not sent back unwillingly to the country of the region. So it's an obligation. And this is a treaty which has been signed by a United Nations. I found out some facts and figures here, which I would like to just, you know, uh, share with you. So this, can you, can you see my screen? Cool. So this is a Refugee Council of Australia. These figures are from back 2018. Um, it's not been updated yet, but I recommend. I reckon it's because uh, just after 2018 December 2019, COVID hit, and the barriers were closed, the borders were closed, so we were not expecting any refugees or even uh, any any outsiders were not allowed because of COVID and stuff. So, largest number of refugees are from Syria, 6.65 million followed by Afghanistan, which is 2.68. South Sudan is 2.29. So this is a map. So, so we have Afghanistan, which is 2,068,229. Syria, we all are aware of what's happening um, there, you know, the wars and those political and social conflicts. So 6,654,368 um, refugees uh, are there, all, all in total. We have Myanmar, which is 1,145,000. In India, there's a total of 962. So it just give us the fair idea uh, the total number of what the country is sitting on. So top five countries of origin is Syria, which is 6,600,000. Sudan is 
roughly just over 2 million, uh, followed by Afghanistan, 2 million 68, and Somalia and Myanmar. So official refugee population. So Australia's official refugee population was 56,993 overall. We are ranking on 45th position. So this is like, this is what we are sitting on. So majority of the, uh, the refugee who have been accepted are by Turkey, which is 3.68. Pakistan is 1.40 million. Uganda is 1.17. It's unbelievable with the facts like Uganda or Pakistan who are still a developing countries, how many refugees have, have actually seek shelter in these kind of countries. So situation is really bad. In, in Australia, it's little hard to get a refugee status or to get um, the rights. Which is that? Which is why we are sitting on fifty-six thousand, and we are on forty-fifth um, in our overall position. That's amazing. Okay. I'll share my screen once again. Could I please ask, does any of us speak a different language except English? Anyone? No? I do. I <laughs> tried. Of course, I, tried. I can speak three. Okay, Supreet, so um, can you explain barriers in your language, Hindi or Punjabi? What sort of barriers? Barriers, you know, if when I say barriers, it's basically an obstacle. So if I say barriers, what does it come in your mind or how would you explain in your language? Um, some tough words, like, you know, I got um, find it hard, like when I'm working with my, some of my colleagues who are, who are using like slang or the language, but now I'm used to it and I use slang as well sometimes. And one of my bosses, she said, are you from New Zealand? You speak like the slang language from there. And I said, no, I'm from India. So <laughs> bit of compliment for me now, like I'm learning <laughs> as you go through it. Um, but yeah, definitely there's a barrier like in, in, in language when you come here and like I migrated here because my cousins are here. So I, um, I came here as a student, but yeah, like it's, um, yeah, it's a bit, little bit tough, like with your accent and, you know, the Aussie accent is a little different and your accent is a li little different. And, you know, some of the cultural things are a little bit different, but as you adapt through it, you can overcome that barriers. Of course, of course. Okay, so barriers is a way in any, uh, is basically any obstacle that is stopping us to achieving our goals. I, I brainstormed some of the, the barriers, you know, the barrier is one thing, but it can be said different ways in our different language. For example, in Hindi, I speak fluent Hindi because yes, I'm from India. So it means badain. Uh, Siren me in Siren, the barriers mean mandated mohasana. Chinese is Chang, and Afghanistan is Mushkilat. What what I hear, what I mean here is different languages, you know, different words, but they all mean same. The problems, the obstacles, what all our people, the refugee people, they feel or they come and they experience. So in Hindi, when, I, when I'm talking about badhai or mushkila, I'm talking same thing. The feeling is same, the crust is same, the gist is same, but it can be, spe can be speaking into different languages. Identifying the barriers. So what we usually do is once we have assessed the, the participant uh, circumstances and the scenarios and the situations, we try to help them to identify their barriers. Um, it, well, because here, my, you know, the team uh, here is our trainers. So these barriers can not only be the barriers what refugee people 
feel. It can be your barriers as well. Think about the situation when we were young and we were looking for work. You know, we just passed out our, our school or a college or university and we're looking for employment. Think about that. Think about your barriers. So every person in this room has their own unique sets of positive skills, attributes, and areas in which we can improve. So you don't have to be a refugee. You don't have to be a migrant. So everyone here has some sort of uh, skills and attributes and also the areas where we can improve. The first step is to working towards a career plan. Personal achievement is to work out if we have any barriers and things that are stopping us to being a able to achieve what we want. This can be anything, our personal goals, for example, our employment goals, for example. So first we need to identify what the problem is. If we can't, if we don't know what the problem is, we can't obviously can't find any solution to it. Some barriers can be obvious. For example, for us, it's uh, language skills, qualification, transport. These kinds of barriers are things we can change with some effort and hard work. And there are some barriers that can never completely go away, but can be less of a roadblock if we identify what they are and develop goals and strategies to address them. Can I ask you a question? Can anybody here have, have they faced any barriers when you pass out the school and when they were looking for work? Anyone? I had my son at 17. So uh, that was a bit of a barrier looking for work in my early 20s was trying to, to balance the childcare and the, all of that. And just the, um, the little bit of stigma behind being a teen parent as well. True, true. And what about like sometimes say, for example, here, I'm, I'm staying in Geelong. If I find a good opportunity or my employment opportunity, which is in Melbourne. So it's one of my barriers as well, because I'm staying in Geelong and my job and a lot of opportunities are back in city. So the one of my barriers is basically to transport. How I'm going to go every day to Melbourne and work. So I have to work on the strategies, how I'm able to you know, overcome or eliminate this barrier. Maybe I can find a house or maybe I can rent a room in Melbourne so I can, I can find myself more easy to work around or I should look for some opportunities which is local to my area or my employment. So these are basically is, uh, the roadblocks we can identify, we develop our goals and strategies and we should address them. So, we, we, I have one activity which is planned as a refugee, where we're gonna do it next. But just before jumping on that, I would like you to think about your barriers you may have faced during the time when we were looking for employment. Does anybody of us, as us, have you faced any of the barriers looking for employment? Anyone? I think uh, location, has sometimes been one for me, as you just talked about, you know, living in one area, but all the jobs in another area, mm. difficult. Um, you know, even sometimes, like I, I've always had a habit of looking for jobs I'm not qualified for. <laughs> so sometimes that's a, exactly, exactly. Matthew. Know, like, but, yeah. again, qualification is also a biggest barrier. Maybe, mm -hmm. you know, I, I dream of working in a CPA or as an accountant. But if I don't have CPA degree or if I don't have accounting degree, I cannot, I cannot work in, in an accounting firm. So, so uh, but did you work out for any, some sort of strategy here, Matt? When you were oh, My strategy was to just go and get qualified, I suppose. <laughs> that got me where I needed to be in the end. So, yeah. Exactly. And, and again, like when I moved from India to Australia, language was my biggest barrier. Yes, we have a strong accent coming from in India and slang, what Preet mentioned. Sometimes I, I never used to get it, what you know, my, my colleagues or even when I was studying my, in the university, what they're talking about. It, it just yeah. used to go above my head. So that was my barrier. Again, by watching movies, you know, watching news or watching YouTube videos or talking or making friends and chatting 
and discussing about it. These were my strategies to overcome. Mm. My, uh, my partner's from Brazil, Gapreet, and she has the same issues. Sometimes she'll come home from work and we have to sit down and debrief about all the things that people have spoken to her about, you know, slangs and stuff like that. She kind of just pretends like she knows what people talk about sometimes, then comes home and asks me what it is. So totally get it. Totally get it. You Anyone can, else? You can teach one slang a day, Matt. Teach What's one that? slang a day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Good idea. A Anyone else? Anyone yes, age is a experience? big barrier. Like when you're first going for employment. Um, and you want to get a really good job or anything like that, people look at your age and go, oh, he's too young, inexperienced, and has no knowledge of the trade or anything like that, or any type of work. So I think age can be a bit of a barrier for everyone when they first try and look for work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And same, yeah, with, same with the same, other way. At the other end of the yeah. spectrum. <laughs> if, you're, if you're older, they might go, oh, no, I don't want to put them on because they might retire. Or And this is probably the same with females and this isn't like that if you become pregnant they look at that it's definitely um you know if you it's something we try and we don't want to talk about anymore but it does happen still i think a lot of employers will look at women and go no i'm not putting them on because in five years they're going to be pregnant so oh, yeah. um that's a big barrier totally. as well totally get it totally get um, it yes. it happened to me like when i step up into a managerial role and people like all the colleagues like they think like i'm too young for that and then, you know, what charity I applied, David? I started I started wearing glasses, so I looked like a little mature. <laughs> and I got it. I got it. <laughs> totally get it. I mean, money. Money is the biggest barrier as well, you know, uh, for our refugee, like people, or even for ourselves. Like for me, it's, I'm still struggling to buy a new house or get a first home buy buy a grant and stuff. So money is a is a barrier as well. Sorry, give me one second. I can imagine Gurpreet saying, "You're my barrier at the moment. Stop making noise." <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry it's it's sunday so you know everyone is at home so sorry um yeah so we were talking about money money is a barrier as well it's the biggest biggest barrier for us because we're looking for to buy a house at the moment and we don't have enough saving because being a migrant from other country so it's one of the barriers as well um, so physical barriers can be pain uh, if you have if you have back pain for example if you're not fit for a job or something, it can be a barrier as well. Money, opportunity, of course. Uh, when we apply for a job and, and when you're turned down because you don't have enough experience, you know, for the job. So that can be a barrier as well. Um, then we have transport, culture. Culture is the biggest barrier. Yes, when we come to this country uh, and uh, of course, the, there's a different culture back home. And then you have to be open-minded and be accepted. So it's it can be a barrier to language, of course, and it can be anything basically. It can be anything which is an obstacle to to achieve your goal. I would like to share one of the video here just to give you an overview of uh, our refugee clientele, what barriers and what things they go through and how they have overcome. So please bear with me for a second. Please give me a thumbs up if it's working fine and if it's audible. Arriving detention center, I forgot my name because they are calling me by a number. By the help of a lot of my friends, I find my name again. If people are seeking a better life in Australia, then why would that be a problem? When thousands of people, they are happy for their newborn babies, but thousands witness the death of their loved ones. My name's Naji Chu. I was born in Luang Prabang, Laos. I arrived in Australia at the age of eight as a refugee. Uh, 
We ended up in three different Thailand camps. My mother went first and she took four kids with her, headed down to the Mekong River. At the foot of the river, we started painting ourselves with mud. Um, I was petrified and there was a man sitting on the canoe with his hand over my mouth the whole, the whole trip over. Uh, we were locked up in a tiny little cell. There may have been about 30 to 40 people in a cell. Uh, we remained there for three months. Uh, we lived on rations of rice and eggs. Those memories are what form who I am today. Horrible experiences in life can give you more strength than if you hadn't gone through them. If you've got a student in year 9, 10 or 11, there's something important that you need to know. If you take a look. I decided to um, do what I was really good at, which was Vietnamese food, and namely rice paper rolls. So I started really small. I decided to use my name and I call it Miss Chu. If, if you love Vietnamese food, you've also got to love my culture. If you love Vietnamese food, and a lot of you do, you've also got to accept the fact that I came as a refugee. Uh, that's the real story of how Vietnamese got to this country. And I hated refugee being connected with negativity. You'll find that most refugees are exactly just like me. They're, they're hard working, they want to do well, and they'll do anything for a leg up. I couldn't think of a better citizen for this country than that of a refugee because they come with that headspace already. I'm Rahala Husseini from Afghanistan and uh, 27 years old and I lived in Afghanistan about uh, three and a half years ago. Since when I was 14 years old I started traveling to, I uh, started running actually to keep safe my, myself and my life. We come by a leaky boat, a fishing boat, 75 person on the boat. And for three months when I was in detention center, I forgot my name. I had a, a number. When they sent me out, they sent me to Adelaide. And after a month, I come to Swan Hill and uh, I find a job. I find a lot of friends in Swan Hill. There's a lot of uh, antagonism towards boat people and we use this reference of boat people without understanding that the people who get into boats to come to this country are absolutely desperate to find security and safety and a new life for themselves and for their families. Why I come to overseas and I don't have any way to go back. Not actually me, all refugees. I love Swan Hill, I have a full-time job, I have a lots of friends and living in a limbo. My name is Hani. I'm from Somalia. I live in Sydney, New South Wales, and I go to Bankstown Senior College. The, the war was not just fire, it was just in front of our house. It was just on the corners of everywhere. 
It was not an easy decision to make and leave my loved ones, especially my mom. At the end of the day, I and my parents just decided they better send me somewhere who will be safe for me to survive. My name is Honey. I came from Somalia. After I come long way from East Africa to Australia, I face depression. Do you know what it's like for I to be always crying? I know I need help. When will this end? There's no need for me to be sad what happened yesterday because it's already gone. It will never come back the same. Even if it hurts, it's just like I have to forget it. Just try to forget all and to continue my new day with new face and new happiness and smile because life is short. For me, school means a lot to me. When I get enrolled, it was the first time I started a proper school. It was the first time that I had a pen and paper. The Bankstown Intensive English Centre is a specialty centre uh, where English language is, of course, the prime focus. Well, Honey has come to Australia through uh, a great deal of challenges in her own personal world. It's great to see that Honey and other students like Honey have aspirations in their life. I know my poems are really powerful for me and what I believe also other people will believe the same. I have a dream, a dream that will never fail. The path I'm going is very rocky and it's really rough, but I have to go to high school, finish, then go to university to do my dream career to become an investigation journalist. Our dreams come true will make our life interested and fulfilled. Thank you. What's our future? Tonight or maybe tomorrow, someone coming in and just send us back to Afghanistan. The word refugee was a positive word. It meant production, it meant good life, it meant opportunities. We have a problem with the media and the politics of this country and we have a problem with the leaders of this country. I really don't think we have a refugee problem. I'm hearing you, lady. Any thoughts? Any thoughts? Someone used to work at that place that guy works. Random. <laughs> That's a good video. Ooh, very touching. Every time I see this, I mm. very touching. I, I totally experience this um, twice a week when I do these sessions, and the stories what they share. So it's unbelievable. It makes me so angry. The um, the gentleman from Afghanistan who said that you know he became a number in detention and it took him having friends before he got his name back and we shouldn't be doing that as a country to people anywhere for any reason 100 percent and also honey like sometimes we take things so much of grant for granted for her to go to high school and having a pen and paper they're grateful for this uh, sort of, you know, um, these luxuries. They, they've never experienced this back home and the struggles they have gone through. But for us, like we take things so much for granted. We forget, you know, uh, uh, we forget about blessings. We always concentrate on our uh, problems and struggles. It's very hard. Okay. This leads us to a case study. Uh, it's about a Myrna story. It's, uh, it's a true story. Myrna is a refugee who arrived in Australia in 2018. She has written that letter. Um, the reason we're doing this uh, activity is again, we need to now- Good we are You also need to be conscious of your time, just to let you know. Yes, I'll be quick. <clears throat> So this story is basically, it's a Marana story. So we're gonna do this activity just because we're gonna brainstorm what the barriers are, what refugee people uh, go through, how is it affecting them physically and mentally, 
and also how we can eliminate or overcome these barriers. Uh, this story is also in one of the handouts um, which I've sent and shared with you. I need a volunteer who can read this letter. Anyone? I'll do it if I can find it. <laughs> okay. Um, I can share the screen if it's okay. Yes. Yeah, that's all right. Am I on? Who? Cool. Me, Seb. I hear you, Seb. Did you want me to read it? Yes. You're on. Okay, sorry. All right, Myrna's story. My personal story may help you get a better understanding of the experiences and emotions refugees face in fleeing conflict in the Middle East and the ways in which the Australian government supports refugees to resettle in their new home. My name is Myrna Alderwood. I am Iraqi. I studied a bachelor's degree of accounting in Iraq and worked in that industry for four years. I arrived in Australia in 2018 with my family after fleeing Iraq and living in Lebanon for three years. For three years, I worked at Western Union as a customer service consultant in Lebanon. We had a good life in Iraq before the war took everything. I had a good job as an accountant and we had a normal life surrounded by family and friends. It was a hard moment the day I woke to find our beautiful street in Iraq full of soldiers. Life was tough in Lebanon, but what choice did we have? On the day our Australian visa was granted, I felt as if I had been reborn. We arrived in Sydney in 2018 and immediately felt we had come to the right place. Australia is paradise, peaceful, lawful and generous. But at the same time when we arrived, I was overwhelmed. Everything was different. I couldn't speak English and the culture was so different, but I felt so welcome and supported. I also found it difficult to find similar work in Australia. The moment we met job provider Matchworks, every, every day I was being taught something new about the Australian way of life, how to get a career and have my degree recognised. I was advised to enrol in TAFE to improve my English. I studied at Granville TAFE and did some further courses, then got a chance to join the Career Seekers program. I don't have the words to explain how grateful I was for that support. Through my provider, we got a job, both my brother and I, now I am working with a huge company in North Sydney, studying at Parramatta College and applying to study at university in the future. Everyone that comes to Australia has a story to tell and my story is just one of thousands of refugees and immigrants that come to Australia every year. I want to be a role model for other refugees. I feel that my dreams have come true, my family is safe and my brothers can get a good education. My challenge is to make Australia proud of me. My advice to refugees is to fully immerse yourself in your new community, put your head down and work hard and don't give up. This is a country where anyone can realise their dreams. We can reach to wherever we want, nothing is impossible for us. We are human and as with other humans, we have the same rights and we should not listen to any rejection. We can do it. Australia gave me protection. Yes, protected me. So Australia is like my home now. Whatever I can do as a national of this country, I will do for Australia. So now Australia has treated me as a second home and whatever makes Australia proud of me, I will do it. It will be very proud for me that I represent Australia and I will be feeling so happy with the jersey of Australia on me. I can tell you that there is no word of what that feeling is like. It is not being a refugee or immigrant that makes you succeed. I can say whatever country you live in or are born in or immigrate to, the key is having goals, hunger and passion to succeed. I am proof that with a positive attitude and the right supports, you can achieve your goals. Thank you so much, Sam. Thank you. This is a life story of Myrna, who, who is a refugee and how, what all the barriers or what all difficulties she has faced in past and how she has overcome that. I usually share this um, story with my participants in the class, just to motivate them that, you know, if Marna can do it, anybody can do it. Um, 
I had an activity planned. Uh, I wanted Deb to, you know, break us into two breakout rooms and so we can brainstorm some ideas. However, because we're running out of time, we're going to do this together. So here is... Um, Sorry, Gurpreet, I actually need you to start taking it to the end because we're just running over a bit much, unfortunately. I'm sorry. No, it's all good. Sorry, I, I tried to condense this workshop into 40 minutes um, session. Maybe you can move this bit to the next session. Of course, definitely. Yes, sure. I'll go back to my PowerPoint slide. Sorry. Um, this is a refugee week, which is like uh, uh, from June 20th, from June 26th, it is celebrated as a refugee week where the theme is unity. So I've got a good news stories here, which I have got it from the website, which is refugee.org.au. Like refugee doctors back on track, saving lives. There's a talented refugee artist who has been awarded as a University Sydney scholarship. Um, so it's basically, if they can find a goal, they can set a goal, they can achieve it. Multi-talented Syrian entrepreneur expands business in homemade organic products. And they're really proud of that. In my next session, as uh, I mentioned, because my both sessions are interrelated, um, we will be focusing on the barriers again, how we can overcome the barriers and how we can do it through a smart goalie, being specific, measurable, achievable, and uh, realistic in a timely manner. And thank you so much to listening uh, to the presentation, sharing uh, the ideas, the barriers which you have come across, and uh, for that video as well. And thank you, Sam, for reading that letter. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gapreet. And I'm sorry I had to take you to the end there, but I'm conscious of the fact that we've still got two more training sessions to do today. No, I, so. I completely understand. It's yeah. just that I, I feel associated mm. with refugees being a migrant in Australia. Mm. Of course. And I really have passion yeah. for them and I really want to do something for them. Absolutely. Let's hear from you first, Gurpreet, get you to do some self-reflection and then we'll get some feedback from everyone. Thank you. Uh, I guess time was not in my favour. Uh, even though I'm so passionate about this topic and the, the workshop, what I'm conducting with Matchworks at the moment, uh, I, I relate to refugee. I really want to help them being a migrant and myself having so many barriers and I've got strategies worked out and how we can overcome the barrier. Um, I'll be very mindful about the time in my next session. Um, so I'm happy with for all the feedback and I'll make sure I'll work on it in my next session. Good on you, Gapreet. So what worked well in Gapreet's session? Anything that you would recommend to Gapreet 